In assembling the Ford SSK chassis, the first component we'll be installing is the rear axle assembly. Before doing this, we must reverse the rear spring shackle brackets found at the rear of each leaf spring. Using the appropriate socket and extension, the nuts are removed and the shackle and the shackle bracket is pulled off of the spring. We thoroughly inspect the bushings for wear and if necessary, we order new bushings from Ford to replace worn ones. Since Ford recommends that all attaching rear hardware be replaced, we have purchased new nuts for the shackle studs. The shackles are simply flipped over from their original position, reinstalled, and the nuts are tightened, partially. Later, we will tighten these bolts to the factory torque specifications found in our factory service manual. After the shackle brackets have been reversed, we elevate the rear axle assembly by placing a floor jack under the differential located at the center of the rear axle housing. We roll the assembly under the steel tubular frame that has been supported on four jack stands. We slowly lift the assembly into position, making certain that the emergency brake cables run under the axle assembly inside of each spring. When the front spring eyes are lined up with the holes located through the mounting brackets on the chassis, we insert the two long through bolts through the bracket and spring mount on each side. Since Ford recommends that attaching hardware be replaced, we have purchased two new nuts and bolts from our local Ford dealer. The nuts are screwed onto the bolts and partially tightened. While it is possible to use only two jack stands, we have found that the small extra expense for the additional stands and the convenience they afford are well worth the investment. We continue to elevate the rear axle assembly so the rear spring shackle brackets go over the mounts on the rear cross member of the chassis. Slowly, we lower the assembly into position and we install 3 8 by 1 and a half inch long bolts with flat washers, lock washers, and nuts. We use grade 5 bolts that can be distinguished by the three lines on the surface of the bolt head. The size of a bolt is always determined by the diameter of its shank. Additionally, we have found that bolts slightly longer than recommended are perfectly acceptable. Our floor jack is lowered and removed from the axle assembly. Using an open end wrench on one side and the appropriate socket and ratchet, we tighten the front spring mounting bolts. Later, we will use a torque wrench to tighten these bolts to Ford's specifications. The two bolts that secure the spring shackle brackets to each side of the chassis are firmly tightened using the appropriate wrenches. We have decided to use brand new shock absorbers for our new car. They are fairly inexpensive and can be obtained from any auto parts store. Using the new hardware that is furnished with the shock absorbers, we first install the shocks to the mounting locations on the bottom of the lower spring brackets on each side of the car. <laughs> 
After we have tightened the nuts on the lower studs with the appropriate wrench, we raise the rear end assembly slightly with our floor jack to allow the top studs to pass through the holes in the mounting brackets attached to the steel tubular frame. The new shocks we are using are direct replacements for the original Pinto. These are secured in the same manner as the bottom. This completes the rear axle assembly. In order to have the correct ride height in our 1929 Mercedes Replicar, it is necessary to remove one full coil from the bottom of each front spring. First, we mark the spring, and then we cut the coil with a hacksaw equipped with a special carbide blade. This is available from our local hardware store. Since the springs are hardened steel, this does require patience. In most cases, we take the springs to a local welder or machine shop and have them do the work. After we've cut the springs, we file or grind a one and a half inch taper at the cut end. This will fit into the recess on the lower control arm. After the front springs have been modified, we raise the lower front control arms into position at the bottom of the cross member on each side of the car. Using the original factory hardware that was removed from our Pinto, we pass the bolt through the front of the cross member lower control arm and out the rear of the cross member. We place the original factory nut on the end of each bolt. The procedure is repeated on each side of the chassis. The correct socket along with a ratchet is used to tighten the nuts on the control arm bolts. These bolts will be torqued to the specifications listed in our factory service manual. We have disconnected the upper control arms from the wheel spindles so they could be properly inspected and painted. At this point, we shall deviate slightly from the factory manual. It will be a lot easier for us to install the front springs after the engine has been installed. That is because the weight of the engine will add necessary compressing force to the chassis. The original bolts are taped into place and the upper control arm is placed into position. We partially tighten the factory nuts. We have used a good quality red primer to paint the various components for visibility in filming. Normally, we paint the pieces with a high quality black gloss enamel before we assemble them. The nuts and hardware are painted yellow only for visual reference. The gas tank is installed next. We'll move to the rear of the car. After locating the original Pinto straps in their correct position under the recesses in the gas tank, we'll mark the correct location on each side of the cross member. This is directly above the rear axle housing. We'll use a center punch and mark the whole locations. Then, utilizing an electric drill with a 3 of an inch bit, we drill a hole through the cross member on each side of the chassis and through the straps. We place the straps against the bottom of the cross member and secure them in place with 3 eighths of an inch diameter by two and a half inch long bolts with flat washers on both sides, a lock washer and a nut. Or we can utilize a lock nut if we choose, eliminating the lock washer. Again, we can use a slightly longer bolt with no problem. After we have secured the front of the gas tank straps loosely, we raise the gas tank into position against the frame rails. Note, the filler hole is on the left side. We pull the straps rearward, then up and over the rear cross member. Utilizing a pair of vice grip pliers, we pull the straps as tight as possible. When necessary, we use a C-clamp to secure the straps temporarily to the chassis. A center punch is used to create an initial indentation for ease in drilling. Our electric drill with a 3 8 of an inch bit is used to drill a hole through these straps and cross member on each side. 3 8 of an inch diameter by 2 and a half inch long bolts are pushed through the holes we just drilled. A flat washer is used on each side and the bolt is secured with a lock washer and nut. If necessary, we could eliminate the lock washer and use a lock nut as a substitute. Again, we could also use a 3 inch long bolt with no problem. We use the appropriate socket and ratchet to tighten all tank bolts and nuts at this point. The excess strap material will be cut off flush with the rear of the cross member. 
When fabricating the firewall, we refer to the instruction manual for proper hole size and location. While a number of different materials can be used, a piece of sheet steel is preferable because of its fireproof properties. We use a tape measure and china marker to mark all hole locations, referring to the instruction manual. Alternatively, a firewall is available from the factory that has all of the holes pre-punched, including those necessary for air conditioning and heater hoses. If we choose to use the factory firewall, we could block off any undesired openings. A center punch is utilized to establish all hole locations. Then, referring to the factory manual, we use the correct size drill bits and hole saws to make the necessary openings. The firewall is also bent to the specifications listed in the instruction manual in order to ensure a tight fit against the floorboard that will be installed later. After we have completed fabricating the firewall, we place it into position against the supports on the engine side of the frame. To ensure an airtight fit, we use Window Weld, which is a 3M product available at auto supply stores, or a good quality silicone sealer between the firewall and frame supports. We secure the firewall to the frame following the instructions in the manual. For our brake and fuel lines, we'll be using steel tubing that we have purchased from our local auto supply store. Available in various lengths, the tubing can be easily bent by hand. A coat hanger is used as a guide before the tubing is bent. We make certain the fittings are at the ends before we make our bends. Our drill, along with a 3 8 of an inch drill bit, is used to drill two holes through the driver's side firewall support brace for the brake differential valve or proportioning valve. We angle the valve rearward, which makes it a lot easier to fit our brake lines to it. The original factory nuts are used to attach the valve and they are tightened securely. We always make certain that the valve is thoroughly cleaned with brake fluid before installation. The illustrations in the instruction manual are followed as we route our brake and fuel lines along the chassis. We use several lengths of steel brake tubing that we have purchased along with the appropriate couplers. Two, three sixteenths of an inch by sixty inches long. One, three sixteenths of an inch by forty inches long. And one, three sixteenths of an inch by twenty inches long. For the fuel feed lines, two five sixteenths of an inch by sixty inch long steel fuel tubes are used. And the fuel return line requires two quarter inch by sixty inch pieces. We route the lines and temporarily secure them to the chassis with large tie wraps. Later, after all connections have been made, we will use steel clamps to secure the lines to the chassis.